Coming up, grab your hat and gloves. It's cold out there. We'll take a look at the wind chill and what it means when you step outside. Also, the 2024 presidential election season is officially underway. We'll explain what exactly caucuses and primaries are and why they are so important. That and what's on your mind. Hi, I'm Lexi from Winchester, Massachusetts, and this is my dog, Poppy. My question today is why are dogs' noses always wet? Thank you. I love my News Kids edition. Bye. We'll answer that question and more. And Oscar-winning actress Jamie Lee Curtis is here to talk about her new project, Just for Kids. This page says, um, just one more sleep, then I go back to school, meet my new teacher, her mohawk is cool. Science and music, zero means none. Learning is really lessons in fun. This is NBC Nightly News, Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. I'm Lester Holt. It's great to be with you, and I hope you're all having a great week. Buckle up. We've got a jam-packed lineup, including our picture of the week. We have two, actually. Plus, we'll put you to the test in our pop quiz this week. The subject, geography. And a bit later on, she's an actress and best-selling author. Jamie Lee Curtis will be here to talk about her new book for kids and answer some of your questions. What inspired you to write the book, One More Sleep? And are you the author and illustrator? We you love Nightly News Kids Edition! <laughs> oh, come on! Awesome, right? But let's begin with the cold front many of us are experiencing. Parts of the country saw temperatures plunge this week, and you may have heard your local meteorologists talk about the wind chill when they're forecasting the weather. But did you ever wonder what wind chill is and how it affects our bodies? Our good friend meteorologist Dylan Dreyer explains. Lester, you are right. When it's cold and windy, we often mention the wind chill temperature. And we show it to you like this. The actual air temperature, for example, in Omaha is one degree. But when you add in the wind, the wind chill temperature makes it feel so much colder. It actually feels like minus 20 degrees in Omaha. So the windier it is, the colder the wind chill is. And here's why. When it's cold, our body tries to keep itself warm. It creates this thin, warm layer right near our skin. But when our skin is exposed to the wind, the wind blows that warm air layer away. The windier it is, the more that thin layer is whisked away. And as our body continues to lose heat, it makes us feel colder. That's why we also call the wind chill temperature the feels like temperature, because this is how it feels to us. The good news is that you can protect yourself from the wind chill temperature simply by bundling up and protecting your skin from the wind. Hats, scarves, gloves, coats, they all cover your skin and prevent the wind from blowing that warm layer away. So the next time you hear us talk about the wind chill temperature or the feels like temperature, that's the temperature you should dress for. And it's not just for us, it goes for our pets too. So if you see a dog wearing a jacket, it's not silly, it's actually keeping them warm. <laughs> Lester, back to you. Dylan, thanks very much. Well, turning now to another story making headlines this week, the first votes in the 2024 presidential election season took place in Iowa, marking the official start to the nomination process. While most U.S. states use primary elections to choose candidates, some other states, including Wyoming, Nevada, Nebraska, and Iowa, hold something called caucuses. On Monday, former President Donald Trump was the projected winner of the Republican Iowa caucuses. This comes as we're just days away from the New Hampshire primary. We know this can sound a bit confusing, so let's take a look at the road to the White House. In November, Americans will vote in the presidential election. Traditionally, there are two main candidates, one from the Republican Party, another from the Democratic Party, the two major political parties in the U.S. But a lot has to happen this year before a U.S. president gets elected. America has a really interesting system of choosing a Republican nominee or a Democratic nominee. Rather than have a big primary election on one day across the country, it usually begins with perhaps an Iowa caucus, then a New Hampshire primary. One of the first steps took place this week, the Republican Iowa caucuses. For the last 50 years, the Iowa caucuses have been the first time in the nation that Americans can actually officially register their preference 
who should be the nominee of the party. Unlike an election where voters go to a polling location, a caucus is a gathering of people in the community, most notably to choose a candidate to be their party's nominee in the general election in the fall. Both the Republicans and Democrats hold them separately. So in states like Iowa, residents must be registered with one of those parties in order to participate. They must also turn 18 by the November election. So what exactly does it mean to caucus? Well, for starters, Republicans and Democrats caucus differently. Democrats in Iowa gathered this week to discuss other party business, not to choose a candidate. Instead, Iowa Democrats will vote for their preferred presidential candidate via mail in the next few weeks. Did you know President Joe Biden is a Democrat and running for re-election? but he, just like every other candidate, must go through the nomination process. Meantime, the Iowa Republican caucuses took place on Monday at caucus sites including schools and churches. Speeches were given on behalf of every candidate, and caucus goers voted by secret ballot. And good evening from New York, everyone. NBC News can now project Donald Trump will win the Iowa Republican presidential caucuses. Former President Donald Trump, a Republican, won the Republican Iowa caucuses. Next week, another important step will take place. You may have heard the word primary in the news. Why? Well, that's because it's the start of primary season. The New Hampshire primary is the first time that you've got voting booths and people lining up to cast their votes and people actually casting a ballot saying who they want to be the party nominee that summer. On Tuesday, January 23rd, the New Hampshire primary will take place. New Hampshire saw that there was a lot of potential for publicity, for money coming into the state, for having a big impact on the American political landscape. So as early as 1920, Party leaders in New Hampshire said, let's have a first uh, in the nation primary in our state. This is going to really put us on the map. And for decades, it did. If you're a registered Republican, you can vote in the New Hampshire primary, while undeclared voters can choose to vote in the Republican or Democratic primaries, but not both. New Hampshire is one of many states to hold primaries in the next several months. When you're the first primary in the nation, that is a big deal on the political horizon. For instance, 1952, Dwight Eisenhower was the hero of World War II. He was a general, but he wasn't running for president. But voters in New Hampshire said, we demand that Eisenhower run for president. Eisenhower won the primary, even though he wasn't running. Ultimately, he got into the race and won the presidency that year by a landslide. Did you know that while people vote for candidates in the primaries and caucuses to be the party nominee for president, they are actually selecting delegates for the party conventions, which take place over the summer. States and political parties use different methods for deciding how many delegates they will award to each candidate. To become a presidential nominee in the United States, a candidate typically has to win a majority of the delegates. At the party conventions, the presidential nominee is officially declared. And then, in November, Americans 18 years and older can vote in the general election for who they want to be president. We know this can sound a bit confusing and complicated, but it's all a part of our democracy, a government by the people. All right, time for our pop quiz. And this week, the question, which state in northeastern America is home to the highest mountain? Is it A, Vermont, B, New York, or C, New Hampshire? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Okay, time's up. The answer is C, New Hampshire. That's right, standing at nearly 6,300 feet, Mount Washington of the White Mountains is the highest peak in northeastern North America and is located in New Hampshire. Did you know on a clear day it's possible to see into five states and Canada from the summit? You can hike up Mount Washington on foot or go in a car on the auto road or take a ride on the historic Cog Railway. And the Mount Washington Observatory offers live web cameras from different spots, including from the tower, which is really cool. 
Now for our picture of the week, and we've got a couple cute ones for you today. First, check this out. A surveillance camera in Lebanon, Tennessee, caught this otter having some fun in the snow a few days ago. Who says playing in the snow is just for kids? Meantime, just down the road, the Nashville Zoo just announced the names for the three Sumatran tiger cubs. The public got to vote on the names, and they are Bulan for the male cub, and the names for the female cubs are Zara and Kirana. The cubs were born in October and are considered critically endangered. They continue to live behind the scenes while they bond with mom. Well, speaking of animals, time for what's on your mind. Lexi from Massachusetts sent us this question. Hi, I'm Lexi from Winchester, Massachusetts, and this is my dog, Poppy. My question today is why are dogs' noses always wet? Thank you. I love my News Kids Edition. Bye. Lexi, that's a great question. And here with the answer is our friend, veterinarian Dr. Matt McGlasson. Thank you so much. That is such a good question, and that's a question I get all the time. My name is Dr. Matt McGlass, and I'm a veterinarian, and this is my best friend, her name is Chickie. And you probably notice with your dog, usually if you if you touch their nose, so if you give them a little nose boop right there, you will notice that usually their nose does feel a little bit moist and a little bit cold to the touch. And the reason that dogs' noses are moist is for a couple reasons. One is because they lick it a lot of times with their tongue. And the second is because they have little glands inside their nose that produce like an extra layer of mucus to kind of keep things wet there. But the reason dogs' noses are wet is because it really helps them smell better. And if you didn't know, dogs have a really, really strong sense of smell. So we experience the world with our eyes and our ears. For dogs, the number one sense that they use is their nose. So dogs' sense of smell is about a thousand times more potent than humans, so they can smell things that we have no idea exist. And what scientists have found out that a wet nose works a lot better than a dry nose. So wet noses kind of help those little scent particles stick to their nose. So that's why your dog has a wet nose. Dr. Matt, thanks very much. Let's turn now to this week's Spotlight. She's an Oscar-winning actress and best-selling <laughs> author who has a brand new project just for kids. The children's book is called just one more sleep and jamie lee curtis joins me now in our studio it's great to have you on kids edition i'm so happy to I be had here you laughing you. right off the top well you did <laughs> and the what's great about the book is that the subtitle is good things come to those who wait and wait and wait, it's a book basically about patience. Yeah, and, and the idea of one more sleep, meaning my birthday is tomorrow, just one more sleep right. and it'll be my birthday. So it's you not and really I- It's my birthday, by the way. Well, yeah. when is your birthday? It's in March, but that's not Okay, but we're the same age. So it's, it's like, are. it's your birthday's coming up, basically. <laughs> what we were talking about though, is like when we were growing up, um, books for children were these sort of very homogenized, cherubic white people in perfect, like outfits, and I didn't relate. I relate to reality. And so for me, waiting for something like that, it's, it's you have to have some humor. The book has to have humor, which is why good things come to those who wait and wait. It's So use it in a sentence, just one more sleep. How would I? So I would say just one more sleep, and it's your birthday tomorrow, and we're gonna have a party. Because remember, these are books for young children. So these are books for, let's say, three to eight-year-olds. By eight, they know when it's their birthday. They know they can read time. They understand. Remember when we were in school and we would do those clocks and they'd say, draw three o'clock mm -hmm. and then you'd... But when they're young, metabolizing time is, is amorphous. Right, but patience is a challenge for all of us as, as grown-ups. Right, but yeah. how many times do we say it to a child, no, 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 just give me one minute but they don't understand what one minute is. It's just noise saying you can't do something. I've used egg timers with young children. So when the timer goes off, something's gonna happen. So metabolizing time is a new idea for very young children and saying just one more sleep or two more sleeps. I was on an airplane coming back from, coming here um, uh, to do my promotion and there were some actresses on the plane who had just come from one of the award shows in California. And when I told her what I was doing, she said, oh, 
That's exactly what I said to my children last night. Just one more sleep and mommy will be home. Uh. So it's it's now a modern way of talking to children about time. I don't want to do all the talking here. We've got some children's questions that, that I for, know for you. you. By the way, your team and the just the welcome here, it's really elaborate. Fun to and, see your book blown up like this, But it's just right? beautiful because the illustrations by my longtime partner, Laura Cornell, are celebratory, funny, alive. They're, it's a vibrant book. It's a beautiful book. Let me Thank uh, you. Let's play the first group of questions. Okay. Here Hi, I'm Mia. And I'm Mason. And we're from Chicago, Illinois. We have a couple questions for you. What inspired you to write the book One More Sleep? And are you the author and illustrator? We, we love, love Nightly News Kids Edition. <laughs> oh, come on. Awesome, right? <laughs> By the way, those are very well-dressed, well-behaved <laughs> children. Well, you guys, here's my answer to your question. What inspired me was my neighbor, Betty. It was during COVID when we were all masked and staying away from each other. First COVID Christmas, it was Christmas Eve, and I went out to get my mail, and I saw Betty and her mom from 10 feet away. We went, hi, Betty. Hi, Jamie. And I said, it's Christmas Eve. Santa's on his way. And she looked at me and she went, no, Jamie, no, one more sleep, then Santa. Ah. And in that second, I realized that's how young people metabolize time. And so I went inside and wrote the book that day after that interaction with Betty, because then I thought about all the things we are waiting for. Um, and so that's how that happened. And what was the second question? Oh, the question was about the illustrator. Oh, yes, you, you I am that. not yeah. the illustrator. I have a long time, 34, 33 year partnership with a woman named Laura Cornell, who uh, is the illustrator. She does all the paintings and drawings, and I write the words. Would you mind reading a passage it from the book? It would be very. I'd love to hear it in your so, voice. So, all the books ha are funny and have, um, you know, they have sort of amusing ideas. But then I also think these books are intended to be read by adults to children. So there has to be an emotional resonance that makes you, the parent or grandparent in your case, want to read it over and over again to children. So I also remember going to school for the first time and how thrilling that was, the new start at school. This page says, um, just one more sleep, then I go back to school Meet my new teacher, her mohawk is cool. Science and music, zero means none. Learning is really lessons in fun. Just one more sleep till I dress up and greet family and friends as we trick and we treat. A ghost and a cowboy, a clown with green hair. My witch's big nose will give them a scare. And then, this is where it gets emotional for me. Just one more sleep, and I'm grateful for living, safe in my home, here on Thanksgiving. I make turkey hands, I gobble pie fast, I'm thankful for family and all the years past. So there's some sense that what celebrations really are, are gatherings of human beings, little, old, older. There's a Hanukkah celebration behind me. There's an Easter celebration behind you. The kind of things people look forward to. But we do them together. And community, family, diversity are the building blocks of our country, our families, and very much the world we live in, the world you report on every day, hard reporting, it's a real place, and I want these books to be real and emotional and funny, which is what life is. They're great books. You've done 14. This is number 14 right yes. now. We should also mention for the kids, you're an award-winning actress with a, a huge library of work, some scary films that maybe your well, parents, the parents will know here's about. The, here is, there are two movies that children will know me from, maybe three. Freaky Friday. Yeah. Beverly Hills Chihuahua. <laughs> yes. And you won an Oscar recently. I what, did. What is that? I mean, what is I that did. like to, to hold an Oscar and know it's yours? Well, if you ever get a chance to see the moment on television, the word shock and awe 
<laughs> um, is not just related to news reporting. It was a shocking and awesome moment for a woman who's been an actor since she was 19. I'm 65 this year. I've been doing this a long time. I love my job. I love it. I love my job the way you love yours. Yeah. And I've been doing it a long time. To get that recognition for a kind of out there movie that was very different, very brave, um, was exhilarating and um, unexpected. The best kind of surprise, the best kind, which was the shock of it, which I didn't expect. Speaking of such, let's play some more questions. Here. I love that you've done this. Thank you so oh, much. Terrific. What can I learn from this book? What advice do you have if I want to write a book someday? Okay, well, what you can learn from the book is that waiting is universal. Everybody has to wait for something, and it's a little bit hard to wait, and it also can be fun to wait. So that waiting, this thing, the anticipation of something, um, doesn't have to be awful but it's very real and that grown-ups have to deal with it and children can deal with it and we can learn to do it together. That's the first thing. And the second question was... Was about some advice if you want to write. Yeah. So here's the thing. I was not a great student. Um, the delivery system of education did not really work for me. I'm an experiential learner. Um, I need repetition in a way that traditional learning didn't work for me. And so I wasn't a very good student. So I never thought I'd write a book. And the miracle about books is anybody can write one. Anybody. Everybody can write a book because the ideas are in your head. And if it's in your head and it's your idea, John Steinbeck, who's one of my favorite authors ever, talks about the individual mind of a man or woman or other or non-binary person, but it's the individual mind which is the most precious thing in the world because that individual idea is the spark of great literature, great art, great music, great political movements. One person has it only. The minute they have it, others can jump on. But that preciousness has to be protected, which John Steinbeck says more than anything. That's what you have to protect, is the preciousness of the mind. And then let me play off that question. For kids who are watching you and they know about your career as an actress and they want to act uh, and get out on stage, what would you, your advice be to them? Anybody can act. Uh, here's, I'm going to now, okay, I'm going to do it straight to the camera, okay? okay? This is how I spent my entire childhood. I had a mom and I would pretend to be her secretary. And I would do it all day long. But I, let's say I was going to pretend to be her, um, Mr. Brown's secretary. Here's what I would do all day as a child. Hello. Hi, it's Mr. Brown's office. Oh, hi, how are you? No, I'm well, thank you. He's not here. No, uh-huh. No, 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 He's not. But he'll be back after lunch, and then I'll have him call you? Okay, great. What number? And then I would write a number on a pad, say, okay, great. Thank you so much. Yes, we'll be calling you back. Bye-bye. That, that's anything. And, and then I would write a note. Mr. Brown called, or, or um, so-and-so called for Mr. Brown. They called at 3 o'clock. They would like to ask you, blah, 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 blah. And then I would put that piece of paper over there, and I'd pick up the phone. Hello, Mr. Brown's office. And I would do it over and over again. I loved it. That's acting. Like, yeah. that's all I do in the movies. It's just somebody else wrote it. And I now say those words. But I, as long as I believe I'm who I am in that moment, I believed I was the secretary. That's terrific. It's something that kids can Anybody utilize can starting do today. Anybody can do it. If they want to be an actor or an actress. Uh, one more question from a viewer. Okay. Here we go. Hi, my name is Anusha, and I have a question for you. Yes. In your childhood, what inspired you to become an actress? Thank you. Bye. Okay. These kids. <laughs> All of them, fabulous. I never thought I'd be an actor. I thought I'd be a police officer. I went wow. to college. I thought I would major in some sort of criminology or corrections and that I would be a police officer. I became an actor by accident. Some of the best things in my life have happened by accident. For me, the best things happen just if you're open to them. Like I'm, my, my whole, this book, I didn't know I was gonna write 
a book again. I haven't written books for children for a while, but I heard Betty say, just one more sleep than Santa. And I went, oh, oh, hello. Went inside and wrote the book. So I, my advice for people is be open. If you're open to life and you're ready to receive life, life will provide wonderful opportunities. And often we get very binary. We get very locked into mm -hmm. this is the way you do this and this is the way you have to do that. And that's not life. That's the military. <laughs> <laughs> and I respect the military immensely. Thank you for all the service. But that's what the military is. It's a very binary idea. But life is not that way. Life is mm -hmm. fluid and non-binary and ever evolving and ever changing, which is what I think we as humans need to do. We have to metamorphosize over and over again, shed skin, you know, like the like caterpillars turn into butterflies. Then you shed it. Snakes shed their skin a new, new ideas, old ideas. You can always I'm, reinvent yourself. I'm a new ideas yeah. person. Jamie Lee Curtis, what a pleasure. What to, a pleasure to, for to, to me. To see you. It's been years since I yes. interviewed you, and it's uh, this is a great book. It's but a great story for thank kids you. and helps us all think really about this idea of patience. And I think the, the phrase we often use, delayed gratification. Yes, well, the ultimate, the subtitle, even though it says all good things come to those who wait and wait and wait, the original subtitle for this book was a gratified delay. Uh -huh. Because it's the subtitle is for the adults. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Well, that's going to do it for us. Parents, just a reminder, if your child has a question about any topic in the news, email a video to us at nightlynewskids at NBCUni.com. We'll try to answer them in an upcoming episode. You can also follow us on Instagram at nightlykids. Thanks for watching, everyone. Remember to take care of yourself and each other. So long.